Welcome to another edition of Crime Time with Duty Ron and Ed Wallace. Guys and girls, we are two retired New York City police detectives with 20 plus years of law enforcement. And if you like all things true crime related from that police perspective, hit the subscribe button, hit that notification bell, so you will get all things Duty Ron and Ed Wallace when we go live or upload another video. Tonight, we're going to talk about the updates in the Dylan Rounds case, and we're going to also speak about the arrest of James Brenner, the, the transient who was five miles away from the home of or the place where Dylan rested his head down at night. We're going to get into it in a few minutes, but before we do, Ed, how's it going? How you doing? We're getting close to you traveling outside the country soon. We're going to all miss you. Yeah. Are you going to have Wi-Fi where you're going? What's that? Are you going to have Wi-Fi where you're going? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm going to bring my equipment, too. Thank goodness. I don't mm-hmm. think we're going to survive without Ed Wallace for an extended period of time. Yeah, I'm going to um, go live from a different continent. Nice. Ed's going live from a different place. Uh, Ed, what's your thoughts on this case before we thank our Patreon supporters and everybody? What, what's, your, what's your thoughts on this thing? Well, the case just took a surreal turn here, hasn't it? Um, so uh, even though, you know, if you looked at um, the uh, press conferences and the releases of information from both uh, the sheriff's office, the county sheriff's office and the FBI, um, they're saying, like, you know, don't make uh, any leaps uh, of uh, that this is associated with, his, with Dylan being missing, but um, hard not to. You know, yeah, it's yeah. hard not to, given he's been a player uh, involved with Dylan and, you know, he's wearing Dylan's hat. Uh, exactly. Lives right near where the boots are, where the grain truck is. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a, I, it's, it's a lot of information to process. But you and I, when we spoke to Candace, you know, just going on two weeks ago that we did that interview with her. Uh, we we had these three we had these three guys Kurt, Don, and Jim. And Jim is James Brenner, a uh, fifty nine year old man that worked for Dylan. And um, you know, uh, again, he he's now behind bars. He's going to be in for a, a good long time, around thirty three months. And he's doing you know he's in with the feds. We're going to get into that in a few. But before we do. I just want to say a special thank you on behalf of Ed Wallace and myself to the Patreon supporters, the channel members, and all the folks who positively engage in this community. You are what makes it a great place. The respect that you, the viewers, show to the victims and their families is second to none here on YouTube. And you guys, we, both Ed and I, and our special guest, Dave Rader, we tip our caps to you guys because... The respect that you guys show is what makes this an unbelievable community. And Ed and I talk about this a lot behind the scenes. We have some, arguably, some of the best viewers on YouTube. So thank you to you guys. Um, You know, I want to play something before we get Dave Rader from Equisearch. He is the director. um, He runs the Midwest chapter, Twyla, uh, and the drone pilots, not Twyla herself, but Twyla has orchestrated uh, quite a bit of work in the Dylan Rounds case. And we got them the ball rolling because we're the liaisons, the law enforcement liaison. Uh, before we bring Dave Rader on, I want to play Nate Eaton's piece because this is important. I'm not going to play the whole thing, but Nate goes into some specifics on this arrest warrant. He doesn't talk about the arrest, but he certainly talks about the specifics of the um of the the arrest warrant. And I want you guys to hear just a little bit of this because some people, believe it or not, Ed, you know, there's so much misinformation out there and so many crazy people speaking about this case that there's some people that their heads are spinning. They don't know what's going on. Um, Nate's um, pretty grounded. He knows what he's talking about. And I want you guys to take a peek at this. So let's play this and then we'll bring Dave right on. Here we go. Somewhat. Uh, These are significant developments. We will see how significant they are in the coming days. But right here, I have a five page arrest warrant for the man who lives near Dylan Rounds. And I'm going to I'm going to give it a second because I know people are going to be tuning in here. Uh, So let me give you some background. If you're just tuning in, this is Dylan Rounds, 19 year old, went to Rigby High School here in eastern Idaho. 
He moved to Utah a few years ago to begin farming on this dry farm. You can see this is his farm here. Um, very rural area near the Utah Nevada border. Dylan last spoke with his mother on May 26th, right before Memorial Day. It was a Saturday. He was worried about getting the grain truck under shelter because it was starting to rain and he didn't want the rain to ruin his grain. And so he told his grandma, I got to get the grain truck in. I'll talk with you later. No one has heard from him since. That was a Saturday. His family went out a few days later and everything was eerie. Uh, his truck was still there, his pickup truck. His camper was still there. Right here is where he was staying. There was his truck. Uh, obviously, his tractor was there, and there was no sign of Dylan. Since then, multiple searches have been done. This is in the, the middle of nowhere. Closest town is about 30 miles away in Nevada over the border, uh, Montello, Nevada. And since then, uh, several people in the area have been interviewed. Now, the Box Elder County Sheriff's Office is leading the investigation. The FBI is also involved. And it is the FBI that filed this arrest warrant just yesterday. And I want to make it clear that they are not connecting this person directly to Dylan's disappearance. But here's what happened. Uh, the FBI went out there. Um, actually, the Box Elder County Sheriff's Office went out to the farm and began interviewing people, including a man named James Brenner. Brenner is 59 years old and was apparently squatting in a trailer about five miles from Dylan's property. He was squatting in a trailer. He did agree to speak with investigators. And um, what happened was on the 16th of June, so just a few days ago, uh, they went and spoke and served a warrant on Brenner's trailer. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to read directly from here on the uh, on the affidavit. And first, I want to say Brenner is a convicted felon. He has served time in prison. I believe it was 33 months in prison for possessing a firearm as a felon. Obviously, if you're a convicted felon, you cannot have guns. He served 33 months in prison for having firearms. He also has other felonies on his on his record. So the police um, spoke with. Brenner, or Brenner, lives about five miles from Dylan's property. On the 11th of June, Box Elder County Sheriffs asked that the uh, FBI come and join the case. On the 16th, they searched Brenner's trailer. They found ball ammunition, ignition caps, black powder, speed loads, all related to muzzle loading. Those were photographed in the trailer. They were not seized at the time. There were no muzzle loader firearms located in the trailer at the time. That happened on June 16th. So the police go over, they search the trailer, they find a bunch of guns and uh, ammunition, they don't take it. Four days later, all according to the, uh, the uh, arrest warrant, on June 20th, a friend of Brenner's who goes by the initials DH in these records, in these documents, DH was interviewed by the FBI and the Sheriff's Office. During that interview, D.H. told the police that after Dylan disappeared and after Brenner originally spoke with the police back on June 7th, Brenner brought three black powder guns over to D.H.'s house and asked him to, quote, safe keep them. Brenner stated that he needed to do this for, quote, his own safety and, quote, the last time he had trouble with the law, they took everything from him. And he did not want the things he had left to be taken from him. DH, the friend, agreed to store the muzzle loaders for him. Then DH gave those muzzle loaders over to the Box Elder County Sheriff's Office, where they were booked into evidence. So I hope all that made sense. Brenner is friends with DH. DH goes over to Brenner's house, says, I need you to store these guns. When he was asked why, he says, you need to keep them for safekeeping, because last time the cops got involved, they took everything from me. And I don't want the things I have left to be taken. Right? Is DH says that Brenner also brought him a rifle, a 22 caliber rifle. DH said he didn't tell police the day before about this rifle because he had been owed money by the rifle's original owner, and he felt that he should have a claim over the rifle that Brenner asked him to store to cover the debt. He explained to police that the rifle had been in the trailer on the property where Brenner had been living prior to him living there by a person who owed DH money. A little convoluted there, but basically, D.H. was owed money 
by the person who owned the trailer before Brenner moved in. Brenner moved in, took possession of the rifle. He then asked DH to store the rifle. DH didn't tell the police about the rifle because he felt that he had possession to it because the original owner owed him money. DH turned that rifle over to the FBI. It was loaded with five rounds of 22 caliber ammunition. So on the 21st, that very same day, the police went over to Brenner's trailer and they seized all of those original guns that they had uh, been told about days earlier. So James Brenner, an arrest warrant issued for him. Police are very clear in here to not connect him to Dylan's disappearance, but it is interesting to note that one of Dylan's neighbors, that an arrest warrant has been issued, that he is a felon, that he had all of these weapons in his possession. He was asking his friends to store the weapons because he was worried that the police were going to come and take them. That is the new news today. We're going to have a full story. Just All right, so I wanted to make it clear, um, James, Brenner, uh, James Brenner was arrested. This was just the other day, and Nate had this information. Um, you know, significant information here because these three players, there's 50 residents in that area, Ed, and if you, if you weed out the good ones, right, um, if you weed out the good ones, it doesn't, there's not that many people to interview. So these three people, Kurt, Don, and now Jim, who's in custody, those are, those are the main players, you know? Yeah. And uh, they all seem to have a uh, check it pass. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, this, this guy who, who's in custody has at least three felonies on his record. Um, and the FBI and locals, I mean, the FBI is probably running the lead on this case. What's your take on that, Ed? Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, because he's being charged with a gun crime, a felon in possession of a firearm. Okay, right. which is the second time for him. He, I think he did 33 months for the last time he did this. All right, if, if I'm not mistaken, Ron, if you if you know offhand. No, you're, you're correct. I have that. You are yeah. correct. Okay. So I don't know if my memory is uh, failing me, but, uh, you know, so I thought I uh, researched that, that he had done 33 months in prison for a felon in possession of um, firearms. So he's done it in the past. And I, and I said this, I remember having this conversation with you uh, with uh, Candace when she was on the program and she was talking about how they had open carry in Utah. And I'm talking, and I said to her, Hey, you probably got a lot of guys out there that are, that are carrying guns illegally. And here's the case. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely remember that 100%. And it seems like everybody in the middle of the desert is packing. And, and you know, these are all folks who have violent past. This guy, James, um, again, he's got, a, he's got a drinking problem. He's violently explosive. Um, I, I read some of his arrest you know, I'm not going into his arrest history here because that's not our job. It's the job of the current investigators that are on it. But I looked into his past and this guy's got some violent um, history and he's 59 years old um, and, and, and he's and he's close. Uh, I, I talked to Candace on the phone and she said both her and her husband uh, and Dylan's father, they know this guy. They know of him. They know about him. Uh, and they've given all their information that they have on him over to uh, the FBI and the investigating authorities. Um, I, I think that everybody, you know, you start from the farm and the employees and anybody that has close contact and you work your way out. Uh, these are the main players in this case. And the, the FBI um, now has this guy in custody, James uh, Brenner. They have 33 months, give or take, to come up with digital, physical, forensics, uh, phone records. Uh, Ed, I know this is your specialty. You are a retired New York City police detective, first grade from the crime scene unit. You want to talk about a little bit of the importance of looking at these shanty trailers that these guys are squatting in and how important uh, the forensics comes in here? Well, let's just start with this trailer, okay? It is next to where uh, Dylan keeps his grain truck. Yeah. Okay. So it's in close proximity to the grain truck, uh, which means it's about five miles away from uh, Dylan's trailers and his pickup truck. Um, he's this, this person is seen wearing Dylan's hat. That right. hat should be seized and tested for DNA. And I guarantee you, you're going to get a mix of Dylan and this guy. 
okay? Yeah. Those boots were seized, okay? Those boots were found very close to this guy's trailer by where the grain truck was, okay? Um, Dylan's boots. It, it was right there. I right. confirmed that tonight. The 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 place where the, the, the grain truck was being stored to stay out of the rain mm -hmm. and the boots, that's exactly five miles out and uh, from his uh, his residence where he lays his head down. So this all falls in that proximity. The, right. the, odd, the oddity of the boots being recovered, this is right there. Five. Now, now the boots allegedly had blood on the outside of them. Okay. So obviously you're going to test those boots for the, you test that blood on the boots to see whose it is. But in more importantly, you need to, to test um, the boots itself um, where you would put them on, where you would touch them to put them on and lace them up. Right. Swab all that area on the inside uh, and see if we have a mix of DNA with this guy, uh, Brennan and, um, and Dylan. And, you know, that will say, hey, this, this guy touched these boots. Okay. Um, then the trailer itself. Now he's squatting in somebody else's trailer. I'd like to f track down the original owner of the trailer and see how this all came about. Um, you know, how is this guy squatting there? But again, that trailer needs to be torn apart. Um, I, I believe they did go in there and um, with the warrant to seize uh, all the black powder stuff. Now, possession of the black powder and the ball and caps and uh, all that stuff, um, that's they're not considered um, firearms that you would require a background check for. And in terms of um, criminal possession of a firearm, you wouldn't be charged for um, criminal possession of firearms for those. Uh, yeah. That's why he wasn't apparently charged in the um, um, the arrest warrant for the possession of the um, the black powder guns, just the 22 caliber rifle. Right. OK. Um, that was loaded with five rounds in it. So, um, yeah, so th there should be all kinds of evidence there. And, you you know, if there is an altercation, if there's some kind of fight, so, you know, dispute, there's going to be cross contamination of the individuals transfer of of. Um, Dylan's hairs and fibers and uh, DNA and so forth going back and forth between the two individuals. And then whoever Dylan um, may have fought with or been in contact with during an altercation, um, th th that in those individuals would have transferred evidence to Dylan. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and this is all stuff that goes on behind the scenes that, you know, we're not privy to. Uh, I want you to talk just a little bit about, and we talk about it all the time ourselves, you know, how important it is, is it for the FBI and Box Elder and whoever is supplementing locally to keep all this stuff close? Because we see the buffoonery that's going on with, you know, Summer Wells case. And now in this case, the craziness that's going on on YouTube, it's almost like a it's almost like a wildfire. Um, how important is it for these investigators to keep that close and not leak it out to the parents, not leak it out to anybody that would get that out because we're looking ahead at a prosecution. You, right, you, right. You, you, know, and so. you don't want these vigilante types too to come out there and say, I'll solve this case and then pick up one of these vagrants out there and do something stupid. Um, in, in addition, you, they, you have to play your cards close to your vest uh, with what you know, because those, you know, there probably are co-conspirators here and you, you know, Right now, they're probably panicking um, that one of their um, crew got locked up by the yeah. not not the county, but the feds. Right. Um, so well, let's see if, if, you know, that kind of shakes the shakes the leaves, as we say, or shakes the trees uh, or the bushes and right. see what kind of what kind of um, movements these people uh, start to do. Right. And to get to justice for Dylan, and I want to say hello to everybody in the chat. Thank you to everyone who is here. Our moderators are some of the best. Alicia B., uh, Jen Lowe is here, Joey Brooklyn, uh, Dawn Marie, uh, Dr. Ed Moskowitz. I see all the familiar faces and some unfamiliar faces, but the channel members are here and everybody's lined up and ready and you know ready to go with us. So thank you to everybody that's coming in the live chatters. Uh, police off the cuff sent us 50 bucks on a super sticker. I guess we're going to have to probably reimburse him for that. And <laughs> next time we go out, he's going to be like, hey, you, know, you remember the 50 bucks? I had a hip replacement. You, you're taking my money and, you know, you got, you're going to have to buy me a drink or a bottle of Cabernet or something like that. So thank now you. you. Now you can outrun him, Ron. Yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> now hands down, I can outrun Bill. Bill okay. Cannon. 
no, no problem. All right. So listen, without further ado, we have the um, Midwest director of EquiSearch, Dave Rader. He's been kindly sitting there waiting for us to talk about the forensics and all the police stuff. Dave, thank you so much for taking out the time from your busy schedule. How are you, my brother? And what's happening over there? Good. Very good. Good to see you guys. It's been a, uh, it's been a minute before, since I've been on uh, with you guys. So uh, you guys are looking really good and uh, always a good program. So uh, well, pleasure. Well, right out of the gate, Dave, before the ladies start going crazy, happy 60th birthday to Dave Rader. He celebrated his birthday the other day. I put a community post up on my Facebook and here on YouTube. And the only comments that Ed and I had a field were happy birthday, Goldilocks, happy birthday, Hulk Hogan, happy birthday, handsome. Dave, you're loved by so many here on uh, Crime Time with Duty Ron, but you're loved by so many across the globe. So um, happy birthday to you, my brother, and uh, thank you for all the good that you do. Appreciate that. That means, that means the world. Um, never thought I'd, I'd make 60, but uh, here we are. Oh, stop. You're looking fantastic. And here's some of the here's some of the accolades coming in. Joey Brooklyn is chiming in with happy birthday. Karen, Joyce, uh, a bunch of people. But listen, um, we're not here to have a birthday party for Dave Rader. We want to talk about Dylan Rounds, uh, Candace Cooley, the you know, the family, uh, you know, Twyla was put on a mission by you and Tim uh, Miller. I know that uh, she uh, got together with Rocky and they coordinated a drone operator. Without me going into it, I'd like you to just put into just some words. What's EquiSearch Midwest's role here? A lot of people, there's, a, you know, Dave, there's so much misinformation. I want you to just clear the record and let everybody know what, you know, your chapter is doing to assist local law enforcement and the family. Yeah, there was a lot of misinformation uh, when we first from the get go. So I just want to kind of uh, clear everything up on that. Um, you know, we, we really don't have anybody that's out in um, that's out west. Um, that's a whole different territory than what we have right now. But um, uh, this case has absolutely made us rethink a few things. And Rocky, I think, is going to play a uh, a great role in this, but just to let everybody know is we do not have boots on the ground. When we got this phone call, um, you know, from the family and, and trying to figure out how can we, how can we help this uh, Dylan's family? Um, the, the, the thing that we could sit there and think of immediately was a drone. So I, um, I got in touch with Twyla in between Twyla uh, myself and we, we we spoke with Gene as far as the colors. In that scenario, we thought that that was the best thing that we could do was actually um, use the technology that that's at our disposal with the locate to see if we couldn't tweak it and cover a lot more ground and and hit specific targets. And and that's exactly what what we did. So we do not have boots on the ground. All EquiSearch Midwest is doing is providing the, the locate system uh, and, and, uh, and Twyla has been an absolute godsend as far as getting this all put together. And again, uh, with Rocky out there, um, you know, when we, when we got this phone call, they had already had search parties and search teams all, already on the ground and, and they already had their command center and everything like that. And the last thing that you want to do uh, in that scenario is interject another search team to, to come in and, and, and add their two cents. We want to work hand in hand with this, uh, with the search teams. And again, those guys out there do uh, a lot different type of searching because of the terrain than what we do. So we would, you know, we would be a lost soul out there ourselves. So we're letting them take care of the ground, uh, the ground under this. And what we're doing is is providing the technology through the drones. And that drone technology, I know, Ed, you know a lot more about it than I do, is just phenomenal, right? Um, uh, heads up and thumbs up to uh, EquiSearch Midwest and the, and the drone team with uh, Gene Robinson. He's a, he is a wizard when it comes to this stuff. Locate um, can do some amazing things with spotting just a speck of clothing on the ground or spotting uh, you know dirt that has been moved and disturbed 
Ed, you got any questions for the uh, big man here? Well, first, happy birthday again. And uh, so um, how much uh, ground did we cover with these drones out there? And uh, how many images um, are we looking at here? You know, I don't want to go into specifics as far as okay. where, because it's, this is an ongoing investigation, and we don't want to sit there and do anything to to jeopardize that, of course. But um, we've covered a, a boatload of ground, and um, I'm not going to go into specifics, but we are into um, a ton of of images that, that they have went through. So, um, you know, we're talking thousands. Mm -hmm. of, of images and and we haven't stopped yet so we're still you know with the fbi um uh, being on ground now uh i, I think things are going to start happening and, and maybe that they're going to make maybe narrow this area down so we we don't have to sit there and have the whole state of utah and have the whole state of nevada to go to so hopefully with the investigation it's going to kind of Kind of narrow this bullseye down a little bit, and and, and I think uh, I, I think we're 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 going to uh, we're going to have success. How many uh, hoops did you have to jump through uh, with the various authorities that were out were out there? You know, as far as I know, through and, and again, Twyla has you know she has taken the lead on this, and um, she has got all the answers. You know, she keeps me in the loop uh, with, with all of this, of course, but. Um, you know, at first it was it was quite the uh, you know who's taking who's taking what you know because you're you're working with Nevada and, and you're also working in Utah, so uh, they actually started in uh, with Box Elder and and then that detective um, put everybody in contact on under one email, and and that's how they communicated out there on on what our role was going to be and how we were going to do things. So, so Twilight made that happen. And, and, um, and since then they, they have constant, I, 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 if I'm not mistaken, I believe that it's, it's a daily conversation. I wanted to, I wanted to add quickly for the listening audience and, and thank you for everybody joining. Um, Box Elder, the local sheriff, the FBI uh, later on, we're all on the same page with welcoming you guys. This was uh there was no fight. None. I didn't even have to call over there. The the you know I reached out to the family, then I reached out to you, and then the ball started rolling. Tim got involved. The good part about this is that I think due to a lot of different factors, uh, all that were involved, law enforcement on the ground, were welcoming. Not just you guys. Um, there was a um, Idaho search and rescue. I have it written down somewhere here. But there was a real large search and rescue group that was also welcomed into this uh, location, and they um, they provided assets as well. So I don't think there was any kind of struggle, uh, as you know, like Ed was asking, you know, how how what did it take? This was pretty much just you know, come on down and and help us out. Yeah, no, but there was, uh, you know, I know with. Um, it's restricted airspace there because of the Air Force and um, the bombing range and so forth that they use out there. But I, I didn't think that our drones or, or your drones rather would uh, would be at those altitudes that would require, um, you know, yeah. Depart Department of Defense or Air Force authorization to fly them there. But I could be mistaken. Well, yep. the, other thing, the other thing, too, is, Ed, is that um, especially when you're using a, a DJI, um they have geofencing to where they won't uh they won't even turn that bird on you won't even get a prop to move and and, and i was a witness to that in st louis where we were working with the illinois state police right across the uh the, uh, the river from um uh, from the arch uh, and I flew gene in on a case it was two years old and um luckily we got the bird up we went to move it to a different location probably Maybe a quarter mile away, and that bird would not would not start. So, um, with that now, you you can have a jail broke um, drone, which DJI has to um, unlock that to where you can fly anywhere, but you still have to get approval from uh, the FAA, and in this case, uh, the military to uh, state what you're going to do, mm -hmm. what altitude you're going to fly. How long you're going to be there? So there was, there was still some steps, but you know, and again, fortunately, when you have somebody that's out in that area, 
and they're used to that environment and working with them. Um, from what I understand, it was relatively pretty much simplified when when they uh, when they uh, the, the uh, military found out what we were what we were actually doing. Yeah, good deal. And, good deal. And under your scar says that the uh, heavy D uh, sparks had to get the helicopter clearance. We played that here on this channel, and I actually reached out to him and. Um, he, his people got back to me and said that the, he would come on uh, to talk. But you know what? Again, uh, he, what he provided to me for me was great aerial coverage, and 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 he did have to get uh, approval from the authorities. So thank you for uh, pointing that out. You took the words out of my mouth. The family now has up the uh, reward money to a hundred thousand dollars. We heard Dylan's father, Justin say on a news interview, the 20,000 initially that he had up was burning a hole in his pocket. He wanted to give that to somebody. So I implore anybody that's out there that listens to this uh, video or any of the videos out there to come forward with information. Any information would be uh, good here in this situation. Uh, and $100,000 is waiting in the wings for you. If you could use that money and you know valid information, we implore you to come forward. Uh, but before we go any further, I want to play this story. This is a quick clip. Uh, my good friend Jeremy Harris, uh, he's a KUTV, CBS2 news affiliate out in Lucen, Utah. Um, he's going to join us uh, on a future live stream. He reported and broke the arrest uh, from the courthouse. He was in the courthouse, Nate Eaton talked about it on his live, but we didn't get to that point. Um, he was pulling, um, there's just information. He was there doing uh, like, you know, his research and he saw, he ran across the documents. So I want you guys to watch his coverage. Hold on a second. Uh, I'm going to queue it up. I just, I thought I had it muted, but you know, you know me, duty Ron kind of stuff. So let me add it to the stream and get it going. Uh, just this is uh, Jeremy Harris. He's going to be joining us to talk about Dylan Rounds in the future. So I want you guys to just watch this. This was from yesterday. This is breaking news on Two News. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us for Two News at Five. We do begin with breaking news. I'm Mark Cabell. And I'm Jamie McGriff. That breaking news in the case of missing 19 year old Dylan Rounds, federal prosecutors have now charged a man for squatting on the property where Rounds was last known to be. Yeah, Rounds disappeared from a remote part of Box Elder County. He was working on a farm there. We sent this push alert out as soon as we got word. Jeremy Harris broke the story on KUTV.com. He's live now at the federal courthouse in Salt Lake City with more on how this all came together for law enforcement. Jeremy? Yeah, Mark and Jamie, 59-year-old James Brenner has now been charged here in federal court with being a felon in possession of a firearm. This case, though, is linked to Dylan Rounds' disappearance and specifically that Brenner may have been one of the last people to see Rounds when he vanished in late May. Now, here's what we know. According to a complaint that was filed in federal court, James Brenner was squatting on a property near where Dylan Rounds' farm was in very northwestern Box Elder County. Now, according to the FBI, they say after Rounds disappeared, they interviewed Brenner and have since served two, served two search warrants at trailers where he was staying. According to police, Brenner took several guns to another friend after being questioned by detectives, allegedly saying he did not want the police to get them. Brenner is a prior felon and is not legally allowed to possess firearms. Now, while the FBI does not name Brenner as a suspect in Round's disappearance, they do say that he knew Brenner, that they were friends and that they were living on properties that were nearby each other. Rounds vanished at the end of May after telling his family that he was going to store a grain truck from his farm because it was going to rain. And according to that criminal complaint, Brenner lived very close to where that grain truck was being stored. I just spoke with Rounds' family over the phone, and we do hope to do an interview with them a little bit later tonight. They say their main focus right now is, remains on finding Dylan Rounds and then getting answers about what happened to him. But at least in this case, federal prosecutors say that Brenner uh, was near him and is now charged in federal court with a firearm charge, and the, the case is still active, being investigated. Reporting live at federal court, Jeremy. So there's Jeremy, great guy. He shared all of those court documents. I have all five of the pages. I'm not going to bore everybody with the court stuff. Ed, you got something to say? No, no, I'm good. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Um, again, he really gave, gave, gave a great outline, and it was him that shared, you know, it was this reporter that shared 
the uh, five-page document, the arrest warrant, uh, any information with East Idaho News. Uh, Nate Eaton, of course, he gave him full credit for it. I reached out to him today and we talked on Twitter. A great guy. We exchanged information uh, and he said that he would be happy to come on the show you know, when uh, additional information comes up. But I want to just emphasize here that, you know, the small details that are being spoken about on these various YouTube channels and these some of the irrelevant details that really do not home in on finding uh, Dylan Rounds or finding what happened to Dylan Rounds or helping to find out, because we're not here to solve the cases. Ed, you'll You'll tell everybody that. We talk to a blue in the faces. Yeah. It's not our jobs to solve these cases. Dave Rader's organization, is his job is to find the missing. He People ask me, well, why didn't Equisearch go out to try to search for um, uh, uh, Gonzalo Lopez? Well, they don't search for criminals. They search for missing people. Um, so Equisearch is, is there to bring the missing home. Lost is not alone. Uh, is their motto and the bottom line is is they will go out to help search but they will not be involved in any type of victim bashing or name calling or going after families and that's not anything that we do here on crime time with duty run we will never do that uh, i spent my whole entire career helping complete strangers in the new york city police department and solving cr uh, criminal cases i never looked at them and said well you know, what's the makeup of your family and, you know, what's your sexual preference? What's your, you know, none of that comes into play here and it shouldn't come into play with any of these cases because if you truly support the victims and their families of what we talk about and practice, what we preach, you don't get involved in that stuff. It's disrespectful. It's, um, I mean, I could just throw out a whole bunch of expletives about it, but I'll save you guys that because um, I don't want to go off on a tangent here. But I want to thank and congratulate everybody who is loyal to goodness and doing the right thing. And, and, and you know, I know, Dave, you appreciate that and you know what this community and what Bill um, from Police Off the Cuff, what we've all um, put together here on YouTube is truly to help victims and their families. And that's what we do. Um, we're not there to pound them down and, and, and abuse them. Uh, and that's unfortunately what we're seeing in some of these cases. And Summer Wells comes to um, my mind, the uh, boys in California City, and it can go on and on and on and on. Any thoughts on um, your organization for people that are listening and just tuning in? What's the role of EquiSearch Midwest and Texas EquiSearch when it comes down to getting called in by law enforcement and the families? Just give people an overview on what you know, what you guys do, Dave? Well, again, you know, <clears throat> law enforcement agencies, as we know, just don't have the manpower and, and the resources uh, at, at hand. So, again, where, where our role is, is to come in and work hand in hand with law enforcement. We don't do the investigation. They do the investigation. They try to put us in the right spot. We all try to sit there and figure out you know, what's, what's the best scenario in this, you know, um, and then, and then we just start covering ground and our job is, is to figure out areas. Number one, number two is, is what resources do we put in those areas? Uh, that's, that's going to give us our, our best way of, um, uh, of accomplishing our goal by, by finding that missing loved one. So it all starts with, um, sometimes law enforcement will, will call me directly um or the family will contact us and then we'll get the ball rolling through um through filling out a, uh, a missing person report and then we then we ask what municipality is is working it what detective is working it we make contact with that and then from there we uh we just do what we do best and that's putting the resources on the ground and and, and trying to sit there and figure out where you know where, where these individuals are how close do you guys try to get to the family and loved ones of the missing? And what is the purpose behind that? You know, we're, you know, they, they become like family. I mean, you, you know, you spend a lot of time with them. You see, you shed a lot of tears, you, uh, the emotions, the ups, the downs, um, you know, how could you not get um, emotionally attached to, to the families? I mean, I, I still talk to a lot of the, uh, the moms and dads of, of the missing, whether, 
whether they're uh, they've been found or whether they haven't been found. You know, you 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 have this special bond that you um you 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 actually create by by through this tragedy. So you know, it's it's hard not to to get in in touch and and stay in touch and you know just check in on them. Uh, bashing doesn't do any good. Bullying doesn't do any good. Um, what what what's going to be good is the goodness of people's hearts. And, and and until you walk in a mile in their shoes, and I have never walked in a mile in, in any one of these shoes. I've never had anybody go missing. But I'll tell you, the boatload over the uh, since two thousand and eight. Um, all walks of life, um, you, you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely horrendous. And you, you, you take this home with you, you don't sleep at night. And, and I'll tell you, uh, Twyla is, <laughs> I'll tell you, that girl is just amazing to me only for the simple reason that she really does get attached to these families and they love her to death because she has a genuine heart. So you, you do have this special bond with these families. Yeah. Yeah. And I've seen it firsthand with you guys, uh, you know, because we've spent countless, you know, hundreds of hours now yeah. over this court. It's it's a it's a little bit o- over a year that we've known each other, Dave. And um, Joe Murray says it good with this hundred dollar super chat. I know he's going to bill me five times over that. He says, stop trying to minimize your efforts, Dave Raider. You and your team are nothing short of angels doing God's work. This is for you and the team, brother. So there's a hundred bucks coming in from Joe Murray. Our, Thank you, Joe. Our favorite. Thank you, Joe. I appreciate you. He's our favorite criminal defense attorney. But thank you, Joe. Yeah, seriously, Dave. Um, I have seen and listened in on the conversations that you guys have with the planning, um, the, the the coordination of resources, and what you guys need to do, and talking about shipping thirteen hundred dollar batteries back and forth from Ohio to Tennessee and to California and all over the place. The amount of behind the scenes work that goes into these cases by your organization, I was just a, a witness to it, you know, over the last 365 days. And and I can't say enough good about it. Um, it it's, it's what we need out there and it, we need more of good people like you and Twyla and, and Jean and the rest of your team and the, the folks who volunteer who are everyday people, parents, you know, um, you know, loved ones uh, they leave behind. Twyla talks about getting babysitters and family members to watch her kids while she goes out on a whirlwind tour. Um, there's Trevor Lee in the, in the chat. She says, the three of you perfectly embody the true goodness. I Listen, coming from Trevor Lee, who is many years beyond his age in, in maturity, thank you. Thank you for that, Trevor Lee. He is boots on the ground on the Summer Wells case in East Tennessee. Cat Lover's coming in with uh, a $10 super chat. She says, hashtag lost is not alone for Twyla because I adore her. And, and, and mentioning Twyla here quickly, Twyla is... Um, going through a tough time. She just lost her granny, right? Her grandma just passed away and, um, you know, she's going through it. She's going through a tough time. So if we could put some prayer emojis in the chat for Twyla on the loss of her grandmother, she lost her yesterday, I believe. Right, Dave? Yeah. 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 It was, a, it was a sudden, sudden thing. Um, uh, came out of nowhere and, um, you know, like I said, that that girl has just been through the ringer. But I will tell you what, you, you you know, you don't get you, you don't get any tougher than what she is. She's she's truly a uh, a good soul. She's she's amazing. Ed Wallace is scanning the chat because when he does that, I see the looks on his face and he smiles. What do you got, brother Ed? What do you see in the uh, chat? No, it's it's just a lot of praise and stuff. It's a humbling. So, but yeah. thank you for all the kind words. Um, we really do appreciate it. Uh, I don't know that we could ever really truly live up to all the praise you guys give us, but thank you anyhow. I think it's important to highlight the good. And, and, you know, Dave is a humble guy. He doesn't like this stuff. I'll be honest with you. You know, he he doesn't scold me for doing it, but he doesn't like take well to this because he does it just, you know, out of just, it comes natural for him. And Twyla is the same way. When I tell Twyla, you know, you're, you're an angel and you're a great, great human being, a great person. She's like, 
duty around. I'd want someone to do this for me. If God forbid one of my children or one of my family members went missing. You know, Rocky has the same kind of heart and soul ingrained in him. It's just something that you either have it or you don't. You know, and there's a lot of people who are disabled that want to help. Like, I can't tell you, and Dave, I know you get these, people send in messages and said, I'm, you know, bedridden or I'm in a wheelchair or if I, or I can't get around well, but can I help you with some stuff behind the scenes? So there's so many people that want to help. And to everyone who's given super chats and, you know, some I might have missed, Cat Lover, um, we got to you, but I know that um, Jill Fiber Floozy sent in a super chat. A couple of other folks, I'm trying to scan back to see them because I feel like sometimes I miss them and I don't want uh, people to think that, uh, well, you, you missed my super chat. Uh, but we appreciate them all, every single one of, uh, of the, you know, the chats, the channel memberships. If you want to become a part of this community, Michelle, thank you for that super sticker. Uh, Michelle Bollard, thank you. Um, if you want to become a part of this community, all you have to do is subscribe. It's free. Uh, you just hit that little red subscribe button. Uh, you share these videos. You put them out onto your social media. You get involved by talking and engaging. Ed Wallace, he's the best when it comes to answering comments. I don't, you know, I try to catch up to him sometimes. He's, he's, uh, he's unbelievable. And the guy is juggling quite a few things. There's Twyla. She's appeared in the chat. She's like, um, she's always here. But listen, condolences, Twyla. Yeah. We send sincere condolences to you, Twyla. But I, I wanted to just quickly um, just go back to one more piece. This is just from um, about 12, 10 or 12 hours ago. Um, it talks about the reward, and I want people to see this. This is uh, only a minute and 58 seconds. So let me add this to the stream, and then we'll come back, and we'll wrap it up. Utah teen. The family of a missing Utah teen says they've tried weeks now with no answers, and they're now raising the reward to find their son to six figures. Fox 13 News reporter Emily Tenser spoke with Dylan Round's mother about the frustrating search and why today was so significant. There's just no trace. One month. That's how long it's been since Candace Cooley has last heard her son, Dylan Round's voice. How are you ready to go? If I knew he was okay, you're I could handle a month, but not not knowing anything. It's just it's just torture. After weeks of searching for the 19-year-old across the desert, his family is now upping the reward from twenty thousand to one hundred thousand dollars. That was kind of our thoughts on that was, you know, get somebody enough they can they can relocate themselves if they're scared to come forward for their own safety. The Box Elder County Sheriff's Office is calling this a criminal case and the FBI is now involved bringing in specialized equipment and high tech. That's going to be our best footprint. I mean, we can't find one on the ground, so maybe we can find something, you know, off of off of the stuff they can truly get off of his phone. Dylan lived on a farm here in Lucene, Utah, and his credit card was last used at a bar in Montello, Nevada, just a day or two before he was last heard from. His family says his boots were found five miles away from his trailer and that his truck appeared to be pressure washed with the driver's seat in a spot that doesn't match Dylan's height. There's just no way. I mean, why would somebody want to hurt this kid? Why would somebody want to take this kid? And Cooley then, hopes and that the Fed's involvement so plus this new reward can bring in the answers they know are out there. It's. I mean, look at this. I mean, I, I got I to just show you guys stop this here. And this is just one of the roads it's just mountains desert um just very confusing dave and i want to go to you quickly on this uh, you know what do you do in situations do you get many searches does texas aqua search get many uh, searches that involve this type of terrain um, you know i was down and and I was on a case down in Midland, Odessa, Texas, and and I thought that that was probably one of the hell on earth. But looking at that and and some of the drone footage that I got from Twyla, um, it is just so massive and desolate. Um, you, you know, you're you're throwing ATVs at it, you're throwing horses at it, but again, um. You know, there's just nothing. It's just nothingness. And I think that that's why we came up with using the drone, because we can we can cover so much more ground 
than what a ground search can do, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So if you have a specific spot to where you need to go and check something out, that's when your, 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 your boots on the ground would come into play. That's nothing like what we have here. Uh, in the Midwest. I mean, it's total opposite. And that's what I was saying before on the show earlier on is, is that this is, <clears throat> this is a whole different ball game. These people are, they know how to attack this and they know the washouts and they know places like this. Um, I mean, you're taking a, a guy like me, throwing him out there. I, I wouldn't even know where the hell to even start because it's just so vast. Yeah. Um, you might have a road here or, or, you know, you might have to drive, uh, 10 miles before you have a pull off. Right. So, you know, with, with, with the helicopter, with the, with attacking this from the air, I think that this is the best case scenario on how we can cover uh, the ground in the search efficiently. And then we can spot check it with, um, with boots on the ground, of course. Ed, any uh, input on that? No, a hundred percent. You get the best bird's eye view from the air then you can direct your foot soldiers down onto the ground to say, okay, I saw some anomalies here. Let's go check this out. And it's the best uh, use of the equipment and the manpower because, I mean, with such a vast terrain, I mean, you could be out there for, for um, a year and still not cover <laughs> as much as you need to cover. Yeah. Yeah. Here's, a, here's, a, here's the thing that I learned, and this is this went years back when the, the FBI came out with statistics is when you went missing, um, you would you would be like three three point five miles from your from your house is, is what the going rate was when I first started this. Now I think we're up into 12 to 20. So but they, they did this in a circumference of three miles, and I think it came out in a circumference, I think it was 28 miles. And in that 28 miles, it would take 260, I think, plus people 12 days to cover that circumference, if that puts that anything into perspective. So yeah. now you're looking at, <clears throat> now you're looking at, you know, 12 to 50 or, or, or 20 miles that, that some of these people are, are taking these bodies to. And, and just imagine the manpower that you would need in order to, to do this. So again, if we have the technology to take a little bit off of the ground people, that's what we do. We utilize the, the air, just like Ed was saying, we utilize it. Uh, if we have an anomaly, like what Ed was saying, then we can send two or three people out there instead of sending a whole, a whole damn team. And, and your point, your point was spot on too. just look at the, um, the case uh, that we had in uh, Reno you know, and where the body was found after she was abducted from Walmart parking lot, uh, the distance is right in there. Yeah. 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 I got another little piece that I want to play because this uh, news reporter, uh, very respectful, um, and I want to just put him on and highlight him for a minute. And then I got a question for you, Dave, and we'll wrap it up. Um, so let me add this to the stream and play this for some of the folks that are just joining. A $100,000 reward is being offered to help find Dylan Rounds, his family posting the reward in hope someone knows where he is. The 19-year-old disappearing on Memorial Day weekend, and there's been no sign of him since. For every missing person, there's a family, and for them, the search continues. Here's ABC's Marcos Ortiz with tonight's Missing in Utah. In addition to the $100,000 reward, the FBI is also joining the investigation all in an effort to help find Dylan Rounds, who's been missing for nearly a month. This is one of many searches done for the family of Dylan Rounds. His yeah, I want to just stop it there because these are all over the place. These kind of, I think her, uh, Candace talked about this, that one of the locals said, if you want to get rid of someone, you walk them up to the edge of that when it's raining and you can get rid of somebody. Ed, do you remember her saying that? Yeah. Yeah. And I think this is the terrain that she was talking about or this drop off here. Yeah. I'll let the rest of this play because this, I, the reason I, one of the reasons I want to play it is because of Marcos Ortiz uh, family really um, likes this reporter and, and he does some respectful work. So I want to show this. And plus I wanted to show this terrain. Mother Joe rounds. who has been missing for nearly a month. 
This is one of many searches done for the family of Dylan Rounds. His mother joined authorities to search along the Nevada-Utah border. 19-year-old Rounds had his own farm near the small town of Lucen in northwest Box Elder County. Rounds was last heard from on May 28th when he called his grandmother. A I mean, look at that overview there. I mean, it's just flat desert. Month has nearly passed since that call, and his mother is frustrated. Stuff like this doesn't happen without people knowing. They're just not talking. You know, they're not talking, and, you know, just, it's like, just come forward. Just somebody tell us something, some direction. We have no direction right now. On Memorial Day weekend, his family arrived at the farm. They found his truck. It hadn't been moved, but his mother found it odd that it had been power washed. His boots were found a short distance from the farm property, and they're now being analyzed. Bong Shelder Sheriff is treating this as a missing person's criminal investigation. It's something the family asked from the very beginning. And the FBI has also joined the investigation, which the family finds very helpful. Somebody was finally listening to what Justin and I had to say and our concerns and picks up their phone. You know, that's been huge. I can text this person. I, they'll pick up their phone. They respond. The family increased its reward to $100,000. They're seeking any information that can lead them to Dylan and to hold those responsible for his disappearance. A private investigator believes something criminal has happened to him. Something of foul play happened to Dylan. There's no reason he was excited to be farming there. His crop was about to, you know, come to fruition for the very first time. So he was excited. There was a man who was bloody and asked Dylan for a ride. It was days before his disappearance. But his mother doesn't believe he had anything to do with the disappearance. The private investigator isn't convinced. Unless they can definitively prove that that individual had nothing to do with this, it's too strikingly coincidental to be meaningless. Somebody knows, and it's more than one somebody. I think there's multiple people who know what happened to Dylan, but nobody's talking. If you know, so there's the. Uh, I have linked all of the information in this uh, criminal investigation missing person flyer. Uh, that's put out by the family. I've linked that in the uh, description box down below, along with the uh, number for. Um, the Box Elder County Sheriff's Office. So um, if, if you guys are, you know, interested in looking at that and taking a peek at it, but I'll let the rest of this play. It's just another 30 seconds. Something, say something. Links to the Dylan Rounds. And it's more than once somebody. I think there's multiple people who know what happened to Dylan, but nobody's talking. If you know something, say something. Links to the Dylan Rounds Facebook page, as well as Box Elder Sheriff's Department can be found by clicking on this story on abc4.com and follow the links. Thank you, Marcos. Um, Dave, my question to you is, what's your thoughts, and I hate to put you in this position, um, you, you're an expert at this, you're searching for the missing. What's your thoughts on this case? Is Dylan close by? Is he far out? What's, what's your thoughts personally on this? What's the gut telling you? I, I think I, I've said maybe 20 miles. I think I think 20 miles and and I would look into places where you need to use four wheel drive. That is the key to this. He's not going to be just on a flat road. He's going to be somewhere either up a hill or in a place that four wheel drive needed to be engaged in, in order to take him to where he's where he's at. Yeah. I'll take 20 miles. Any thoughts on that, Ed? No, I'm with him. I'm 100% with him. S since the um, truck ha was engaged in four-wheel drive, but they didn't realize that it it wasn't working. Um, so, And the seat was moved uh, for a position for a shorter driver. Um, so, yeah, I'm 100% I'm on board with that. Yeah. You know, and again, the search continues behind the scenes. We know that, you know, Dave, you, you've dealt with, uh, you know, small town sheriff's departments, uh, you know, desolate areas where they're out in the middle of nowhere. These searches go on without us knowing about it. I was in Aruba all last week and all of this stuff developed, um, you know, forensics, FBI, locals, 
search warrants obtained, uh, electronic uh, search warrants for cell phones, tower pings, things of that nature. This is all ongoing and it continues as more people become in, in that suspect pool, as more people, you know, each interview that you do, each interview and interrogation, as Bill and I like to say, each person we put in a box and we interview them can lead to other perpetrators or potential perpetrators or potential witnesses. And it's like, you know, you walk down a hallway, each, you know, each, these doors just start opening up. Uh, and, and, and Ed, you know about that because uh, interview and interrogation 101, I know you've taken those courses. Uh, I, I went out to Farmingdale and did, did mine with the army uh, quite a, quite a few years ago, but um, you know, it's uh, interview and interrogation is a science and, you know, having this guy, James Brenner, in custody, um, you know, the longer they have him, the more he starts to get, you know, detoxing from his alcohol addiction and his, perhaps any drug addictions that he might have, they'll be able to interview him as this time goes on. Uh, and, and that $100,000 is going to be huge. And this is a very transient community. So $100,000 to uh, somebody out there is you know, I mean, 100,000 in and of itself could be life changing for many people, but especially for people like this um, in this type of transient community that are squatters living in somebody else's trailer or something like that. And these, you know, everybody, those types of people, they all know each other. They all hang out in, you know, small little area and they talk. Yeah. OK, so somebody knows something. And I wouldn't be too surprised if that hundred thousand dollars doesn't get scooped up by somebody uh, giving up information. Yeah. A hundred percent, hundred percent. Hey, I want to just say thank you to the replay viewers, my moderators, and all the folks who are engaging in the chat. You guys are, again, what makes this a great place. If you're not yet subscribed to Crime Time with Duty Ron and Ed, please hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell, and make sure you share this video. The more eyes that get on it, the better off we'll be. I just wanted to say quickly before we close, um, Candace Cooley asked me to mention uh, that she did. Uh, there was quite a few people asking this question in the chat, um, but she did through her attorneys um, put out a cease and desist to the private investigator that they fired. I'm not going to mention his name. I'm not going to give him airtime here. Uh, but she did. Unfortunately, this is a mother who's looking for her 19 year old son. Um, she had to hire an attorney uh, with her husband and Dylan's father and uh, issue a cease and desist. And that's that's really sad that she had to do that. Uh, but she wanted me to make mention of that. I'm making mention of it here, and that'll be the last you'll hear of it from me. Um, again, we are here to support and help enhance the search and you know support of the family members of missing. It doesn't matter who you are or what you are. We don't care. We, you know, we just put everything down and we go at whatever case that we're going at. Uh, there's no digging into, you know, financials or sexual preference or um, cr past criminal history. We help find the missing and that's it. Uh, again, I want to say thank you to Dave Rader, Twyla Cisco, and the whole crew at Equisearch Midwest. These guys are what unbelievable. I've linked in the description their Facebook and all the ways you can get a hold of them and support them. I encourage and implore each and every one of you to support Equisearch Midwest. Um, these guys are unbelievable. Uh, Dave, you got any parting words for the audience still about a 1400 folks here? Again, I can't uh, thank you guys enough. Um, you and Ed, um, everybody involved, um, all your listeners, um, the people who follow you, um, you, you guys absolutely rock and, and are the best on the planet. And, and, um, I can't thank you guys enough. I, I will go on, I guess I'll go on the record is saying that I think is if, if the way that this case is going and I, I got a feeling that the noose is tightening, a lot more, and like Ed said, and you said, as far as with the uh, the hundred thousand dollars, I think you're we're we're going to have an answer within the next two weeks, and I think that Dylan's going to be recovered and and brought home. 
Amen to that. Uh, you know, again, find Dylan Rounds, you know, you know, listen to the family, support the family, support law enforcement, support the folks that are investigating this case. Jennifer Nobles from uh, Bakersfield, there she is. She says, Equisearch Midwest, you are amazing. Dylan Rounds is a great young man and deserves to be found. If you know something, say something. Well said, Jen, and uh, love and respect to you and your family. That's, uh, you know, she, Jen is a friend since uh, Oren and Orson West, Sincere and Classic from Bakersfield. You know, we've thrown out over $12,000 or more at the billboards for the boys. Um, and their, their foster parents, the adoptive parents, I, I, cur I stand corrected, the adoptive parents, their trial is going to start in this month. And we're going to be covering that heavily. We're going to be on the Sincere and Classic trial. Uh, um, Trizelle and Jacqueline West, they need to fry. They need to never see the light of day. And they need to be convicted and sentenced and put away. And I hope they rot behind their cage, behind their jail cell uh, for the remainder of their sad, sorry life. Uh, they need to tell us where those, where those children are. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And, and, and again, I want to close with, you know, we support, we support the victims and their families. We do not bash the victims and families. If you have good bona fide information, pass it along to the FBI and the uh, Box Elder County Sheriff's Office. Those numbers are linked down below in the description of this video. That is a way to help. A way not to help is to go out there and put out a bunch of toxic drama nonsense. This does not help the victim first and foremost and their families. You know, there's there's more to this than just um, the investigation and the family. There is real a real person that is now not with us as far as we know at this time. So think about what you're doing. Think about what you're saying. And um, if you don't have anything nice to say, then don't say it at all. Uh, Miss Tammy125, thank you for the $10 super sticker. Much appreciated. Love and respect. Black Rose 11, always great to see you. It is the 4th of July weekend. Uh, you know, everybody, if you're out there celebrating and you, you know, you're, you're doing whatever you're doing, make sure you don't drive and get behind the wheel of a car. Do it safely and remember what this holiday is about. You know, uh, Ed, I don't need to sit and preach to the, uh, to the crew here, but we have to remember what all, what the 4th of July is truly and really about. Uh, and, and Joe Murray has said it in the chat. He's I'm, I'm watching him. You gotta watch him close. You know, those defense attorneys got to keep an eye on them, but yeah. Um, thank you everybody for joining Ed final words. I know you, you say a couple of quick things, but anything on this with forensics or anything you want to give to the people who are on the seat of their, you know, edge of their seat about this. Right. Just, you know, all law enforcement agencies are having uh, manpower issues and you know, there's a, a lot of shortages uh, in um, various departments. So please, please, whatever you do, don't call these agencies up um, to inundate them with questions about these cases or, you know, don't, don't, you know, uh, uh, my brother's friends, sister's nephew, girlfriend told us this and call the police and send them on a wild goose chase, looking this stuff up. Uh, you know, so please, if only if you have some solid leads or anything like that, which should you pick up the phone and, and call in um, with that information. Yes, see something, say something is important. If you see something, say something, that's important. Not triple, quadruple hearsay. OK, yeah. so that's all I want to leave with that. But, you know, my my normal is, uh, you know, stay, stay, stay safe, stay prepared and watch your six. There it is. You heard it from Ed Wallace. Thank you, Ed, for that. Uh, Jeff, uh, Jeffrey Crowley is celebrating the birthday. So she's 29 today. So happy 29th birthday. Here she is. Um, I'll, I'll highlight her. There she is. Lost is not alone. Happy birthday. Many wishing you many more happy and healthy birthdays, just like we wish Dave Raider. Happy birthday, Jeffrey. Happy yeah. birthday. Yep. So listen, I want to wish everybody a, a good weekend. Um, and I want to just end this live stream by all, what I say all the time. God bless the world. That includes everybody here. God bless the United States of America. And God bless each and every one of us here in the chat. But especially all victims of crime and their families. Dylan Rounds, 
and his family needs us now more than ever. Let's be supportive and positive and get behind them. Let's not try to knock them down and kick them when they're in a bad position. This is a position that no one would ever want to be in. Uh, Joe Murray, everybody please take some time to read the Declaration of Independence over the weekend. Joe Murray is always ready, willing, and able to put people in check. And thank you for that, Joe Murray. We love you, brother. Um, Good night from New York City, Ohio, and we don't know. Ed has got so many satellite remote locations. He could be in Jersey. He could be in Staten Island. He could be in Afghanistan. He could be in Iraq or Africa. We don't know. We don't know where he is. Could be a bunker. Yeah, a bunker somewhere. You know, you never know with him. But we sure do hear Kara crying in the background. Do you want yeah, to put her Yeah, it's time for me to take her out before I put her to bed. <laughs> <laughs> thank you to everybody watching i'll see you guys on the next one from ed wallace uh, dave raider and i good night talk to you soon thank you guys have a safe weekend folks peace out